Welcome to the Lynette Zhang YouTube channel, where we support community and sound money globally. So let's grow this channel as quickly as possible. And the best way to do that is by subscribing. So hit that subscribe button below, hit the bell. We'll let you know when we're bringing out another really important video. And today I wanted to talk about barterability, which is why you see all of these things around here, because anything physical is barterable. And especially we all know how crazy people went during 2020 running out of toilet paper, right? So anything, foodstuffs, anything physical is barterable. And the other thing that I want to point out to you before we get going on this is this is a 20 Bolivar bill. This was minted on the 29th of October, 2013, as Venezuela's stock market was making new highs and they were also already experiencing hyperinflation. This Venezuelan bill is 500 million bolivars, right? Million bolivars. Um, but, and that dated December 3rd or September 3rd of 2020. Is it the value of this going up or is it the value of this going into oblivion? There are all different ways that they can remove your ability to barter. And we're going to talk about a key one today. This is the one that we talk about all the time, but we're going to talk about a key one because quite honestly, you need to make sure that no matter what you can provide yourself with food, water, energy, security, barter ability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. And there is a change that is happening right now that you need to be aware of. Okay. And of course you see all these coins here, silver, gold, real, different sizes. All of this is barterable and this is good money. All right. Let, let me talk about where we're going because this is critically important that you realize now back in 2008, Money market funds are money market mutual funds. They are mutual funds. They are the plumbing. They're the water that runs through the plumbing of the global financial system. So they are a critically important tool. They've been sold to you as safe as a savings account, which, and actually, I mean, how safe is a savings account? Because they can sweep your funds underneath. This is what happens in the intangible market. There's so many different ways that they can screw you. Sorry for the term, but it, but it's just true. But uh, in 2008, for the very first time, money markets broke the buck, which means that their that their value, their where we think, oh, a dollar in and a dollar out. Okay, well guess what? It went below a dollar and this was significant. There were a lot of reforms that happened after that, but they also saw that those, that those issues were still rampant in money markets back in 2020. So they talked about money market reform. We've talked about that and now it's coming to pass. The difficulty of cashing out investments to keep up with investor demands continues to be the biggest weak spot for money market funds globally. Local regulators should consider whether rules such as minimum liquidity requirements need to improve. In other words, their ability to halt your ability to take those funds out of money market is growing. We've got to have them faster. Stability watchdog talks about calls for money market reforms to accelerate, to speed up because they know a crisis is coming. When do you want to know about that? Right? If you're holding your wealth or any wealth in money market funds, which is highly probable, then your ability to remove those funds when you want to in the next crisis is going to be stopped and you will not be able to use that money. The money that a lot of people think of as their emergency money, there will be no barter ability because you will not be able to access those funds. Let's continue because we know that they are still 
of it. They are still vulnerable to runs. That's still the biggest issue. They have to stop that. So, you know, don't change behavior, change the rules. And by the way, oops, missed that. These rules were passed in July, but they go into effect over a year later. Again, it's that distance piece, right? They want to make the changes, but then they want to wait to introduce them to you so that you don't relate one to the other when the reality is, is they are all relatable to each other. Who's going to stop this? U.S. bank lobbyists rank swell to post-crisis high amid regulatory pushback. The money market, the banks like the rules the way they are. They understand what those rules are. They can use leverage. They can do anything they want. So this is just the difference in bank uh, lobbyists, the number of lobbyists, right? So this is all tra trade groups. This is the big eight. The, so the biggest eight banks. And then of course you have the medium sized banks, but it doesn't matter because even though it looks like the medium sized banks have gone up among all banks, Citigroup was the biggest spender for the third year in a row. Why are they spending all of this money on lobbyists? And by the way, are you spending any money on lobbyists? So if these politicians are getting greased by all of these lobbyists and they need to make new rules, what do you think the chances are that those rules are going to continue to favor the banks that are greasing the wheels? I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But the Bank Policy Institute, a trade organization, chaired. So, okay, these are trade groups, right? chaired by J.P. Morgan Chief Jamie Dimon, which has been at the forefront of the Basel pushback, and Basel III Endgame is coming into play now too, increased the lobby spending by 80% in 2023. 80%. Why would they do that unless they wanted more control over those rules that are coming out? Well, here's a thematic review of money market fund reforms. Let's look at them because they put in this, I mean, I need to adjust this a little bit so I can see it better, but they gave us this great illustration of the money market vulnerabilities. You don't think about this because you think of them as being safe, but in stress event, investors reduce and redeem money market shares to obtain liquidity, right? That's barterability to meet margin calls, build cash buffers. Now, margin calls is all of that leverage, borrowing money to buy other assets or put into other fiat money assets and gamble with. When the markets go down, then these margin calls rise and you have to be able to meet those margin calls or the fund will be forced to sell off your assets, right? And it doesn't matter what they get for them because they just need that money coming in. So this can create sudden and large redemption pressure on money market funds. It's also typically why when a market is imploding or going down that you will see spot gold go down. It's because they need to pull liquidity. They need to pull that barter ability from anywhere that they can. And gold is the most liquid asset. I mean, at this moment, even in the spot market, in this form, 100% of the time, in physical form, okay? But the problem is, and this isn't just in money markets, this is all across the world, the, the, uh, all across the spectrum of financial products. The liquidity mismatch between assets, things that they're holding in those money market funds, and redemption terms, makes money markets vulnerable because they will hold assets in there that are not liquid like that on a dime. But if they get a whole lot of redemptions, right? People asking or other cor corporations asking and needing them because they need to meet margin calls or build those cash buffers. Wow. That's what that they can liquidate money market funds, at least at this point, just like that. So they seem really liquid until we hit a crisis. Then what we've seen in the past, not so liquid.
because in many, this is true for many cases, there is that liquidity mismatch. In other words, you can redeem the shares like that, but the underlying assets underneath may take more time. That's what they're talking about there. So therefore money market funds are being forced to suspend those redemptions. In other words, you need that cash for barterability to use to support margin calls or pay your bills or whatever you need it to use for. And all of a sudden, boop, nope, no access. We halt your access to that money because once you make that deposit, it's not really yours anyway. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. And your, your perception means nothing in a court of law. But the degree of vulnerability depends on the investor composition. And this is really important because you might say, well, I, I don't think I'm vulnerable to it. But if an institutional buyer who's buying on your behalf is in there, well, that can create a problem. So the degree of vulnerability depends on investor composition, the proportion and type of institutional versus direct retail, right? Because the institutions are going to make it more vulnerable um, or I'm sorry, less vulnerable because they can simply not redeem them. Whereas if you're just a retail investor, so this could also be for large corporations, et cetera, if you're an individual and you need that money as a buffer to come up with margin, you're going to be more subject to want to pull that, those funds out of these money markets. Now, here's the problem that they see. I think this is so entertaining, really. Central bank intervention leads to moral hazard risk. Okay. In other words, if they have to bail them out again, well, they know they're going to be bailed out, especially if they're in a larger bank. They know darn well that they're going to be bailed out. In a much smaller bank, probably not going to be bailed out, but then those banks will simply be absorbed by the larger banks. And we saw that huge almost a year ago. So the moral hazard is that the banks and, and the institutional investors, these guys don't change their habits because they feel like they're so large that they are systemically important. And it'll be back to save the children. We can do anything we want. We can abuse you, the, the little investor that doesn't understand all of this stuff. We write all those contracts so they're written to our benefit, not your, the individual investors benefit. But that's the moral hazard risk is that you might notice that they, that the banks would be less likely to do anything to shore that up. And you're going to be, you're going to notice that more. And that can lead to cross border spillovers. So in other words, country to country, because we are all incestuously intertwined and that contagion effects across the wider financial system. In other words, if they can't pull the funds out to meet those margin calls and they're forced to sell those, those underlying shares or assets or whatever you want to call it, right? Then that will push them down even further, creating more margin calls, which creates a right, a righteous doom loop, right? Where one supports the other and you have a market implosion. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? This vulnerability can be amplified by a high share of institutional investors and a stable or low volatility NAV. So let me explain that. Okay. So what I said earlier was if you're in an institution unless, or, or you're an institutional investor, so you make this deposit into your 401k or, or an IRA, et cetera, and you're allowing somebody else to manage that money. As long as you are not requesting a redemption, no problem. They'll stay pat. They'll stay firm. They'll keep it in there. Whereas the retail investor is going to need to pull that more quickly to meet those margin calls. If however, you start to make demands on that money market and liquidate, they're going to have to prevent you from doing that. So 
in the beginning of a run, you're not going to see the institutions necessarily trying to liquidate the money markets unless you are, unless the individual retail investor is trying to pull those money, that money out. Now, a stable or a low volatility NAV, NAV stands for net asset value, right? So we're used to seeing a dollar in, a dollar out, something like that. But what we saw in 2008 is that that money market fund, instead of coming back out at a dollar, broke the buck, went below a dollar. Now, the money market managers have still been able to keep it that net asset value as a dollar by adding more funds to it so that you can't see it. The changes that were proposed are a little bit different, but you have to ask yourself whose best interest is supported by the changes. And let's take a look at what those are because the U S the SEC imposes money market fund rules to thwart rapid outflows. So this is how it's presented. Like the SEC is really trying to do something good and to make it more obvious that they're going to eliminate your ability to push it, to pull that, those funds out. And they just approved sweeping overhaul to fund rules on Wednesday. Really? Really? 5.5 trillion industry will face new fees and liquidity levels. So this is what they're saying is going to do that. But that's what they did the last time with the money market reforms coming out of 2008. And we saw that it really wasn't working in 2020, right? So here it is. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission decided, oh, this is, by the way, is perception management at its finest. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission decided Wednesday to require fees that could significantly affect a key corner of the $5.5 trillion industry, although the regulations will make it more expensive to yank money during tumult. Okay, they backed off though. This is really the key here. They backed off of a swing pricing proposal that the industry opposed. In other words, swing pricing is when the, the net asset value can break the buck, go below a dollar. Do they want you to know that? No, they do not. They don't want you to understand what's happening in the underlying assets or instruments in the fund. So they like to keep that at a buck and it's worth the cost to them to do that because if you realized what was really happening, you wouldn't own any of these things. But swing pricing would reveal the underlying problems because the net asset value could and probably would go negative. The reprieve marks a significant victory for JP Morgan Chase and company's asset management unit, because they are institutional investors, State Street Corp and Federated Hermes Inc., which had opposed the measure. Boy, all that lobbying hmm, looks like it paid off. What do you think? What you should realize though, is this is hidden counterparty risk. There's only one financial asset according to the Bank of International Settlements that does not run any counterparty risk. And you're looking at it in my hand right here. Gold is the only financial asset that runs no counterparty risk. Banks need, you know, they must do more. So at the same time, they're talking about banks must do more on counterparty risk. Wow. Banks need reliable, comprehensive, granular, and frequent reads. The public individual needs reliable, comprehensive, granular, and frequent information about their counterparties to make prudent decisions. That's me saying it. They think the banks need to know this. I think you need to know this. I think you might consider doing your due diligence, following those links like I have them and forming your own opinion. Because while the banks need to do that, frankly, I think you need to do that as well. Obtaining this information can be challenging because, and this is true, this is even more true for you 
but obtaining this information can be challenging because of client activity happening away from the bank. In other words, private equity, which is still incestuously intertwined with the banks. But for you personally, obtaining this information can be challenging because of the bank lobbying advantages. Whose best interest do you think they're lobbying in? Their own, not ours, not yours or mine. And keep in mind, again, Bank for International Settlements working paper, what share for gold? And this is all inside of the exchange, foreign exchange. So this stuff, okay, this is foreign exchange, but gold is in there too, because gold has been money for thousands of years and everybody agrees on that. So here are the four conclusions that they came to the bank for international settlements, which is the central bank or central bank. First, Gold is the only case of a financial asset with no counterparty liability. Didn't say one or two, didn't say one or three, said the only case. Second, unlike currencies in debt, because that's what this is, gold kept at home is not subject to political ma manipulation. You hold it, you own it outright, it runs no counterparty risk. Third, Gold has been empirically proven to serve as an inflation hedge over time. They can manipulate the spot market, but the physical market is very different. And if you go in the only physical market, like with this, like with this, that's where you see the truth. You don't see it in the spot market, which has lots and lots of paper gold contracts. Last, its most widely recognized feature is its potential value in highly adverse scenarios. They I think we're going into a highly adverse scenario. Proven, proven. Nothing else has been proven for thousands of years. This is why gold is the foundation of dynastic wealth. And dynastic wealth is wealth that's lasted in families for 300 years. So if you like this, please help us grow this channel, share it with everybody, get them to go in and subscribe, give us a thumbs up, leave us a comment, share, 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 please share because ignorance doesn't make anybody immune. And I'm sure you know a lot of people that are sitting in money markets thinking how safe and cozy they are. They're not going to be safe and cozy in this next crisis. I know without a doubt that together we can make a positive difference. If we come together on a global basis, we've got to retain our monetary choices. So if you have any questions about this or anything else, send them to questions at lynettezang.com. And until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.